Our next reader is somebody that I've been doing various projects with for a number of years. Hello! <laughs> <laughs> like chapbooks, political campaigns, and she is the queen of flyers on various color paper. Uh, her poetry very clearly expresses her beliefs. She was, um, her poetry was described by Mark Rudman as uh, distemper is her muse. She lets you know what she thinks and where the world should be. She's also my partner on Wilder Side Media and on the Wilder.net, on the Wildside.net, my wife, Kimberly Wilder. Yeah. Yeah. And she's also a wonderful wife. Yeah. Well, I introduce them by saying distemper. <laughs> it is my favorite line. <laughs> Dream pattern. Nothing exciting ever happened on our block under the black expanse of sky where we knew the Big Dipper would hover all summer. Still the crispness of it all was enough to give the children dreams of spaceships flying formations and elaborate messages to the homes below. While there never was a girl in a straight back chair in a neighbor's garden, the order of those little plots with curling pumpkin vines and waiting salads made little girls dream every night of princesses sunning themselves amid rows of tiny green sprouts. When we grew up, only wisps were left of crashing flower pots or nightmares of lost bodies uncovered in the woods. The memories that hold are mostly of friendly white spaceships, summer palaces, and swimming pools lined up in careful harmony on Hyacinth Lane. I had a sad thing happen last month. My friend Jean passed away. And so today in Northport, they're actually reading poetry for her. But we were you know, committed to here and all our friends. And we're, we're going to have another poetry reading for her next week. So um, I want to read a poem from her. So this is by Jean Schmidt, who has a blog at Fairscape that her husband's keeping up for her. Hate Boat. I came into this relationship with enough baggage to fill the cargo hold of the Queen Elizabeth II. I picture myself exiting this life as I cross the river Styx on that very ship. I will be its cruise director. I shall be in charge of waiting little bistro tables where two by two, all my in-laws, outlaws, and ex-laws will be seated, smoke curling around their heads. Empty cocktail glasses, full ashtrays, elderly non-relations will beg my constant attention. Drooping loops of fray paper, dirty confetti, Decorate a floor where scuffed high heels tap while hems of faded prom dresses sway as they look for something interesting to do before they arrive in Hades. I will be responsible for keeping glasses full, ashtrays empty, and the music going. There will be a sort of big band with odd instruments that will all be playing a different tune. No one will be dancing. It will be a vast room of mysterious perimeter. I will not be able to see an end to my misery as our crowd fades into blind distance. Our crossing will be rough. Some folks will be sick. I, of course, will be in charge of taking care of them as they puke. Many will be looking out portholes, searching for that final destination. All that they saved for, all of their lives, all the rewards they had hoped to gain wait just past their horizons. As such sets, they will promise themselves that yes, tomorrow when they awaken, they will find themselves where they want to be. Alas, each day will start the same way, party hats at tilt, smoke still curling, band playing, no destination in sight, water still rough, ship pitching from side to side, and they will all be asking me over and over again, are we there yet? Why isn't the sky blue? What is the meaning of death? Try to make this a sense of community since we said we were bringing Long Island poets and we have lots of good poets here. Um, I wanted to bring another Long Island poet in and that is Kate Kelly who's from Northport. And um, I guess this is a little bit um, proud, shall we say, but she wrote this poem about me and I wanted to read it. <laughs> Sorry, I have no shame. Olive Branch of Elm for Kimberly. Should she speak to you of womanhood and her grandmother's mother, of men who dishonor Colonel of Warm carried into, first, into day's first light? 
Should she weep for loss of innocence, swept heedlessly across bare floors, when her arms held nothing but the pitch of fear as a heart beat irregular drumsticks against her wounds? One might understand it is not only woman speaking, more simple girl weeping, but man bellowing, desecration of music. Okay, how much time do we have, huh? writing a lot lately, so I wanted to bring one new poem, so this one's a little bit raw, and it's dedicated actually to David McReynolds, I don't know if any of you know him, but he's a local political hero, and the poem is called Nature. His father would bring home fresh pineapple, angular green tops waving upwards festively, cutting it open carefully became a Sunday treat. Sweet yellow freshness in an otherwise dull cans from the pantry existence. So, in his retirement from a long history of political meetings, embattled arguments, ironing out leftist manifestos, he sought refuge in the care and study of bromeliads. Ornamentals with leaves like pineapples, Spanish moss, exotic varieties would carry one naturally to strolls through arboretums road trips to the Vanderbilt Estates, a private garden here and there. Still life is life, as tedious and complicated as it is. And he came to experience as much debate, intrigue, even infighting in the Bromeliad Society as in the Socialist Party. So many people for holding fiercely to their belief that to form a separate group for Talandia could bring the organization into upheaval. And um, I, um, a few years ago, I wrote this really um, angry, cathartic book about education because I went to Sachem High School, which is one of the um, biggest school, suburban school districts in the state. And I found a lot of anomie in, in that big school, and I didn't think it was a great system. So um, I had written a poem about um, where we go to school that was very negative, and I read it to a father, and he said to me, okay, now where's the solution? So then I wrote where to go to school. So to this poem about all the infighting in the Socialist Party, the Bromeliad Party, and anywhere else that you go, I have my poem that's kind of a solution to that, which was actually written first this time. Painted Blossoms. Don't think for a blue minute, peace lies in dreamy eyes of smiling Buddha blinking across fields of pink blossoms. Peace is no quaint sea, not warm aroma of homemade cookies, nor sound of luggage placed on holy ground. Peace is constant motion, careful balance, endless visual rush of a purposeful journey. Walking through bright hallways of quiet building where well-dressed people shuffle calmly past each day is not peace. Peace is the man in wooden shoes looking up at lights to uncover poison. Peace is the courage to speak out, shatter comfort, demand justice. Peace is not the people around you suddenly linking arms and taking up song. Peace is the cumbersome process of controlling your own temper so you can smile at ordinary colleagues and small children who contradict you. That Buddha is not napping in his field of delicate blossoms. He's resting from a conflict resolution conference with his roommate. He is considering the next move he will make to stir petals into beauty. Wake up to the people around you, he calls. Steady yourself for a long life of patience, sincere communication, bravery, love. When you hear him, you will notice the vital piece of an artist's hand working paint onto huge canvases. might be a little long, but I think, if I, I think I have enough time just to make it. This is my profit poem, because I wrote it at the last presidential election for the primaries. And funny enough, Kucinich is still in the poem, and we still have to listen to Kucinich. So this is dedicated to Dennis Kucinich. A place called hope. This poem is a mission. Good people against hope. There is no hope for American politics. No Democrat will rise up to save us. Democrat, Republican, Democrat, Republican, you lose either way. If you are a good person, you must abandon false hope. 
You must abandon the man from hope and everyone behind and beside him. If you are a good person, you will remember how Bill was different, working class like us. If you are a good person who was old enough to watch TV in 1992, you will remember watching The Man from Hope. How, how, you will remember seeing him on your tiny silver screen. How one Bill Clinton from a small town with a hard life, who listened to railroads and loved his mother, was going to ride a dusty railroad car into the White House and shower us with blessings, heal our country, be one with all the good people, help all the little people. He was little himself. Remember how you knew that, watching The Man From Hope? And try to really remember, take yourself back in time, forget what you know now, and really feel it, how absolutely sure you were he was the one. Feel your confidence, your joy, that there was in fact this man from hope. Yes, if we can choose this man, everything will be all right. And he won. We won. We got him in. Followed our hope, followed the bright, shining path of the little people. We never thought we could really win, but it happened. Now is your heart still open? Can you hold up that feeling next to what followed? Don't ask, don't tell, left service people confused, shamed, no better than before. Trade deals and the shuffle of monstrous corporations. Do you remember that Bill was in charge during the Battle of Seattle and he wasn't wearing a butterfly costume? Empty judgeships, which we felt then as a cowardly sigh. Now the judgeships he gave up on waiting empty for right-wing plots and nominations. If you are good, then climb a cell tower and shout, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. If you are a good person, try to remember Ronnie Guineer and Jocelyn Elders. Think about being held up as a leader, used as a token, and cast aside when you started to tarnish someone's centrist image. If, even if you are a good person, you might abandon me when I tell you what I really want to say. You might leave if I tell you what I really want you to do. I will be as generous as a manipulative facilitator. I will be as open-minded as a right-wing Republican and give you choices. But I know what you should really do. You are a good person, and a thoughtful person too, so you will have the courage to forge your own path and write something in. You know on the ballot, with the little pencil, you write in peace, or Mickey Mouse, or the name of your second grade teacher who you knew somehow, someday, would be the one to save the world. The act itself is revolution. Voting is revolution. Writing is revolution. Self-expression is the key to the universe. Whatever you do, I am saying, do not give yourself back to hope. Hope is what got us here. You know in your heart of hearts, you know this didn't start with W. So what I am saying, I am getting closer to what I really want to say. Don't vote for Democrats. You gave them your vote before. You gave them all your hope before, and they betrayed you. Don't even listen to Democrats. They will fool you again. They have the part of Hollywood with money and contracts and military consultants for their war films. They have shiny literature. They make really good movies. You can't say you won't fall for it. You already did that once. I already did that once. Don't listen to Democrats. Kucinich is not a knight in shining armor. Dean is dead and the war in the water. If Kucinich is a knight in shining armor, he will never get past the primary. If Dean wins, he will morph into one of them. Even hope can't stop them. To be part of their team is to buy into the Clintons one more time. The Clintons will produce war movies for them. The Clintons will work themselves into their hearts. The Clintons are the ones with the spotlight and book deals and purse strings. And they are the ones fallen from hope and don't forget it. Hillary will hold out shiny apples and the new Democrats will tempt you at country fairs. The best of them, Kucinich and Dean and the Kerry who is not a war criminal, seem young. They seem hopeful. They seem shiny. Though hopeful and shiny and making proclamations about campaign finance, they are full of dirty money and broken promises. They are on the team of the Democrats. Keep the money in the family. It cannot stay pure. Even the most hopeful ones, they are full of corporate money. Don't let them deny it. It is coming out of their ears. Do you think they will turn it down? I will fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. I will not advertise someone else's false hope. I will vote as a good person, a good person made aware by time and loss and lost opportunities. I will vote as a poet. I will vote as Walt Whitman, knowing that it is not a poet's job to pick the 
winning team or measure out the strategy. Knowing that poet is a code word for good people who love children and animals and would help the poor. Knowing it is a poet's job to annoy tyrants and to find little pencils at polling places so you can write in hopeful things in a little rectangle. Peace, green, peace, green, peace, green revolution. You have found me out, but I said you had choices. Oh, I want you to go green, how I want you to go green. But I will take anything, a write-in, a scribble, a vote for a minor socialist, something or other party. You are a good person, so look at all the donkeys, elephants, and star shapes on the ballot and vote for something else. Do not see the flags and stars and eagles without seeing the great donkeys and dangerous elephants lurking behind them. Those donkeys and elephants want war. They kill people. You are a good person and you can see that I have vision, so let me teach, let me preach to you. Green Party, the winning is for later. Green Party, build, building for the future. Green, it is a form of expression. Green, good people and poets and good poets like these things. Green, it's an adjective, it's a movement. Some of the kids use it as slang for marijuana. The Green Party is the only other. The Green Party is more than hope, it is better than hope. Growing in a lot, an apple left on the tree. Sorry, I can't help with you, Carson.